Gregory Orr was born in Albany, New York. He grew up in the country outlined by the northern part of the Hudson River Valley. He has written a number of poems about that neck of the woods. One is about, among other things, the deer that has set a fire and burned. I like the poem because, among other things, it reminds me of deer burning in southwestern Michigan. I have here a satellite photograph of the northern part of the Hudson River Valley, taken in 1973. Gregory Orr is not in the picture because at that time he was in Michigan as a junior fellow in the University of Michigan Society of Fellows. Before he went to Ann Arbor, he won the Academy of American Poets Prize at Columbia University, the YM, YWHA, Poetry Center's Discovery Award in 1970. Before he went to Columbia University School of the Arts, he did his undergraduate work at Antioch College and Hamilton College. In reading through his poems, I didn't find any about college. I did find poems that spoke of such things as a transparent rose swallowed by its stem, bones singing through skin, bread rising in ditches, black ferns unrolling, hungry hats, and lying together in the sand at dawn. Many of Gregory R's poems have a surrealistic quality, though unlike the quality of the early surrealist's work that resulted, according to Andre Baton in his circle, from the fortuitous encounter of a sewing machine and an ironing board, his figures forth from the planned encounter of spirit images. It's as if his automatic writing were done not in the dark, but in the clear light of day. Gregory R.'s poems have appeared in such publications as Antaeus, Antioch Review, Columbia Review, Epoch, Little Bolero, The Little Review, The 70s, the Paris Review, and Poetry Now. His book, Burning the Empty Nest, was published in 1973 by Harper and Rowe. The second book, Gathering the Bones Together, was published by Harper and Rowe in 1975. This reading is supported in part by grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and Poets and Writers Incorporated. I have uh, three other announcements to make. Uh, it's one uh, I could almost weep at uh, reading it, but it's not a complete surprise to me. Kofi Werner will be reading here January 5th. Thursday at 8 p.m. That's here in Lecture Hall 102. There will be an open reception after this meeting in the Senior Commons Room. Please, no smoking. And now, a great deal of pleasure to give you a great, great hope. The sound right? Can you hear me? Um, lacking any other clear sense of how I might organize the reading, I decided to do it chronologically. It seemed I couldn't go too wrong there. So I thought I'd read four or five poems from my first book first. It's a poem called Sleeping Alone in a Small Room. I won't say too much about, I'll try not, try not to say too much about poems. Maybe all I would say is that I'd read this poem first because uh, 
involves an intersection of dream and waking reality, dream reality and waking reality, which interests me. Sleeping alone in a small room. There are dawns when the window is white with moths or black with the ink they spin out of their bodies. A dream of stones covered with snow or I stand on a hill at night counting the fires in the valley. Once I held a blue cup shaped like an hourglass Looking into it, past the narrow waist, I saw her small child's face staring up from the bottom. Then there are mornings I wake between darkness and light and see the cloud that hangs by a rope from the steeple turn red and begin to dance. Tom might have said that another characteristic of my poems is that they're short, especially the first ones. This is a three-line poem called Washing My Face. Last night's dreams disappear. They are like the sink draining, a transparent rose swallowed by its stem. Getting Dressed. It's a poem in three parts. I'll just pause between them. In the morning, I pull on my helmet of skin backwards. I see what a light bulb sees through a lampshade. Putting on the white gloves the ones with little teeth that close around my wrists. Pale feet, two corpses that will not stay buried. I thrust you into my boots. Wearing this barbaric armor, you go out to battle the air, the stones, the earth that wants to swallow you. and pieces of paper I entered the empty room I sat on the floor and drew pictures all day one day I held a picture against the bare wall it was a window climbing through I stood in the sloping field at dusk as I began walking Night settled, far ahead in the valley, I saw the lights of a village, and always at my back, I felt the white room swallowing what was past. The girl with 18 nightgowns, and each one to the advantage of her breasts, which were present in softness, and under softness were present like miniature rabbits in the Andes that only come out at night.
love poem. A black biplane crashes through the window of the luncheonette. The pilot climbs down, removing his leather hood. He hands me my grandmother's jade ring. No, it is two robin's eggs and a telephone number. Yours. That's, that's that. Um, uh, thought I'd start with the title sequence from the second book, which because is a sequence of seven poems. And I think since you're hearing it for the first time, it needs a certain amount of context and background to be absorbed. It's called Gathering the Bones Together. Uh, it has an epigraph. It's dedicated to a younger brother of mine. The epigraph is, when all the rooms of the house fill with smoke, it's not enough to say an angel is sleeping on the chimney. Uh, what I'd like to do is explain somewhat the background of the poem which is a, a kind of an autobiographical sequence. Uh, I felt after reading the first book, after writing the first book, there were certain things that I knew were, I wished to write about, but I'd only be able to write about indirectly, in terms of angels sleeping on a chimney or something. Uh, when I was very young, grew up in upstate New York, as many people in the country do, I learned to hunt very young. And by the time I was 10, I had my own rifle sort of thing. And uh, at the age of 12, in a hunting accident, uh, killed my younger brother, who was responsible for his death, the Peter Orr, the poem. So in a sense, this is a poem that begins, that begins to, uh, that works from that event into other areas, I hope. Gathering the bones together. One, a night in the barn. The deer carcass hangs from a rafter. Wrapped in blankets, a boy keeps watch from a pile of loose hay. Then he sleeps dreams about a death that is coming. Inside him, there are small bones scattered in a field among burdocks and dead grass. He will spend his life walking there, gathering the bones together. Pigeons rustle in the eaves. At his feet, the German shepherd snaps its jaws in its sleep. Two. A father and his four sons run down a slope toward a deer they just killed. The father and two sons carry rifles. They laugh, jostle, and chatter together. A gun goes off, and the youngest brother falls to the ground. A boy with a rifle stands beside him, screaming. Three. I crouch in the corner of my room staring into the glass well of my hands. Far down, I see him drowning in air. Outside, leaves shaped like mouths 
make a black pool under a tree. Snails glide there, little death swans. Four, smoke. Something has covered the chimney and the whole house filled with smoke. I go outside and look up at the roof, but I can't see anything. I go back inside. Everyone weeps, walking from room to room. Their eyes ache. This smoke turns people into shadows. Even after it is gone, and the tears are gone, we will smell it in pillows when we lie down to sleep. Five. He lives in a house of black glass. Sometimes I visit him and we talk. My father says he is dead, but what does that mean? Last night, I found a child sleeping on a nest of bones. He had a red leaf-shaped scar on his cheek I lifted him up and carried him with me, even though I didn't know where I was going. Six, the journey. Each night I knelt on a marble slab and scrubbed at the blood. I scrubbed for years and still it was there. But tonight, the bones in my feet begin to burn. I stand up and start walking. The slab appears under my feet with each step. A white road, only as long as your body. Seven, the distance. The winter I was eight, a horse slipped on the ice, breaking its leg. Father took a rifle, a can of gasoline. I stood by the road at dusk and watched the carcass burning in the far pasture. I was 12 when I killed him. I felt my own bones wrench from my body. Now I'm 27 and walk beside this river looking for them. They've become a bridge that arches toward the other shore. Next poem is called The Hats. Uh, I guess it's about the distinction between, I guess, about, I guess it's about adult humor and children. The Hats. The hats are hungry. What will they eat? The funny uncle puts his hand into his hat and pulls out an empty sleeve. All the parents are laughing, but the children are scared. What will the hats eat now? The hats our fathers wear. 
See the hat in the corner? Has it been fed? The builders. Midnight, the field becomes white stone. We quarry it. We carry the cut squares strapped to our backs. On the side of a bleak hill, we build our hut, windowless but filled with light. The last poem from the uh, book that I want to read is a, a sequence of, uh, I'll say it's a sequence of four poems uh, called Domestic Life. I should explain a few things about it beforehand. Uh, so when, when we lived out in Ann Arbor, my wife was going to school full time. And I was staying home, uh, trying to write each day. And she was a psychology major at the time. Came home with the phrase "housewife psychosis" one day, which is which is a syndrome Freud described. In fact, Freud's description didn't correspond to how I felt, but it always seemed like the the problem that I had could best be described as housewife psychosis, the result of being alone in a house for too long at one time. And uh, I think somewhere in the, in the uh, third poem, there's also a, a kind of a, a pun on losing one's grip on things, failing to hold on to things, which is, is a play on a figure of speech, which is unusual in my work. So. So I mention it. Domestic life. Today. Open yourself up. Today, that's no different than opening a refrigerator door. Large chunks of meat. Eggs scattered on the metal racks and cowering in the back, a tiny, frightened woman. You are huge and clumsy. You fumble for her, breaking all the eggs. And she eludes you. You don't feel a thing except cold inside. Before dawn, your wife left before you woke. She scratched a note on your back. You try to read it with mirrors. You decide to talk to the cat, but when you open your mouth, honey colored wasps fly out. The blood in the light bulbs burns less brightly. The waterfall. Failing to hold on to things, a man can become a waterfall. His friends stare, silent and aghast, as he disappears over the cliff, carrying off his books, his wife, all this furniture. Fall cleaning.
this morning, the almost weightless bodies of insects drift down from the ceiling. It's seasonal. You have to expect that sort of thing when you live in a burrow under the earth. Yesterday, a package arrived in the mail. It contained bird beaks in assorted colors and sizes. Some are small, like yellow thorns, but others are larger. I slip those over my fingers, clack them together, and dance around the room in my gray bathrobe. The insects revive. I am their god. They dance after me up the tunnel and out into the autumn woods. Um, next poems I'd like to read are poems since the uh, second book. Um, I'd say in a, in a sense, the first directly and the next two indirectly uh, concern the same are about the same subject as the title sequence from the Gathering the Bones Together about the brother's sudden death. Uh, my mother died a bit after that. Uh, first poem is called Interrogation. Uh, it involves a kind of a, not exactly a dialogue, but after the after a death, an accidental death, any kind of death, the police have to file a report. So in this case, uh, it's an interrogation in which my father and I sat with a state trooper, none of which you would know from the phone. Interrogation. Is this your son? No, it is a rifle. Is this your brother? No, it is a child on the ground, the earth of November already hardened with cold and see the dry stalks stiff in the wind. Is this your child? No. It is the bare earth we drift above as clouds, but our shadows, dark pools, do not move. Spring floods. This is in two parts. Uh, it's set in Virginia the first year we were uh, living there. The part of Virginia we live in is red clay country. So the soil is, is red, and uh, because of the clay, we get a lot of floods. The water runs off quickly. Spring floods. Later that week, when the reddish, silt-laden water subsided, we found a deer high in a tree, wedged there by the flood, its legs outstretched as if leaping, its neck snapped and fallen back along its flank.
in a muddy field, an open coffin, only I could see. It was a boat my mother sent to fetch me, just as she sent the flood. Water roiled so deeply, who could calm it as she once did, laying her cool hand on my forehead in the dark room before sleep. This poem is called Song of the Invisible Corpse in the Field. A cheery title. Um, it's a song that, that is being sung by the invisible corpse. I don't know the tune. And still I lie here bruised by rain, gored by the tiny horns of sprouting grass. And all the while, I hum the song of spiders, drawing across the dulled mirrors of my eyes, accurate maps the spirit might use. Always death at the center, like Rome, or some oasis toward which all paths tend. I am the absence under your feet, the pit that opens, tooth with dew. next poem is called Trockle in Hell. Uh, this may or may not take a lot of explaining, but I'll give it a lot of explaining anyway since I'm running ahead of time. Uh, trockle in Hell. The trockle in the title is uh, Georg Trockel, a, uh, an Austrian expressionist poet uh, who died during World War I, of suicide, of an overdose of cocaine, and was uh, uh, was a poet who was very important to me. Uh, I imagine him crossing over into hell. The hell that I imagine is uh, populated by angels rather than by devils, because I grew up as a Protestant, and uh, my experiences of there was not much distinction between the, the brand of Protestant that I grew up under. Angels and devils were, seemed to be about the same to me. They always seemed to be accusing. Uh, and uh, Trocco was a very obsessive poet. And so this, this is some, some of this is in it the poem itself, Trockle in Hell. When I crossed over, the angels accused me of the same poem again and again. So I held up the face God gave me and showed them the deep and lovely line, a single recurring tear sliding earthward, carved on a stone cheek. Next poem is called Swamp Songs. It's in three parts. It's dedicated to my wife. Uh, I had some explaining to do to her about dedicating a poem called Swamp Songs to her. So I might as well explain it 
also to any audience. But where I grew up in the uh, northern New York countryside as a young youngster, my favorite occupation was uh, wandering around the swamp in a, in a ditch that, uh, that I enjoyed a great deal, catching turtles and that sort of thing. I, I think that was one of the emotional centers of my uh, youth. And my wife was, is the emotional center of my later years, so it only seemed natural to bring the two together, like introducing an old friend to me from Swamp Songs. I'm glad when my boots sink deep in the ooze and to pull loose against the smooth suck, I grab thick tufts of swamp grass. On a wide hummock, I kneel, bend close, and watch my numb forearms and hands, pale, herbivorous dinosaurs that yank and chew huge mouthfuls of cress at the bottom of an ancient lake. We lie at dusk on the naked bank, watching a red-winged blackbird perch on a cattail stalk, and a muskrat paddle slowly through weedy shallows toward its mound. I guess actually the next three poems are also out of that same period of uh, my life. And the next two poems are about neighbors on either side of either side of us. And uh, this is Christopher Augustinovich. We were picking strawberries in the patch behind his shack. He and I knelt with heads almost touching as we worked two sides of a green row. He jabbered about his youth in the Tsar's army, paused, looked up, and gaped to show me five yellow stumps in a reeking cave. Do you know what did it? Old Chris asked with a grin and a wink. Liquor and kissing. His very words. Liquor and kissing. The the next one is called, the, the man's name is Worthy Bigsby up the road the other way. Uh, the title is Worthy Bigsby Repairs. Uh, that was written on the side of his, uh, his old uh, vehicle. Worthy Bigsby Repairs. Each day his battered hearse passed our house Ladders strapped to its sides, dragging huge plumes of dust. If we saw a door tied on top, we pedaled to Road's End, where he lived beside a pond. Our father had been inside his place, reported that all its twenty windowless rooms were empty except the green trailer hidden in the middle. From a lilac thicket, we watched as Worthy braced his scavenged rectangle of wood upright in the mud and began to build another room around it.
the migrant camps. Uh, the area the Hudson Valley grew up in was uh, is apple orchard country. It's a story about the migrant camps. Sat beside my doctor father as the farmer's flashlight guided our car down a rutted orchard road to a cluster of shacks. Smell of wine and kerosene, blare of radio music. Watched as he sewed up wounds from blade or bottleneck. A sunny morning in August, we walked past men on high ladders, buckets at their waists, women and kids stripping bright fruit from the low branches, stood and witnessed, then signed the certificate for a gray finger bone that protruded from a small heap of ashes and scorched tin. The title of this poem is called Hopi Tal Albert Schweitzer. It's set in, uh, in the, uh, back, uh, back in the mountains in, in the, on the island of Haiti, 1961. Uh, when I was uh, 13, my parents, my father, and our whole family moved to, uh, to an American hospital in the woods in Haiti and uh, named after Schweitzer. And uh, this is a poem about that. Hope you tell Albert Schweitzer. I pass the old beggar who sits sucking on a corn cob pipe in the shade of a huge gray mapu tree, its roots stuck with candle stubs gifts for the ghosts inside. Down the hill, past the stench of the courtyard where burrows are tethered, across the parched lawn where kin of the sick squat beside charcoal fires cooking rice and red beans, up the steps and through a double set of screen doors that never yet kept malaria out. Mother, I'm coming down the halls toward the room where you lie, coughing and soon to die. And if I had known, as no one did, that this would be the last visit, what could I have brought? All I have, the sweat, and sights and smells of Haiti under my straw hat. This poem has a long title which goes, an abandoned family cemetery in the pasture near our house. It goes all the way across the page. It's uh, March 1977, Virginia. Uh, where we lived in, in uh, Virginia this past year, we, there was a, uh, the house is, the acreage we live on is also uh, beef cattle property. 
pastorage. And uh, in one of the pastures, there's a uh, fenced or walled cemetery, similar to New England cemeteries, an abandoned family cemetery in the pasture near our house. White, tooth-like chunks of quartz set in cement atop this low stone wall. Starved cattle trampled a muddy flatness around it all last winter, but couldn't get in. Passing by, I see the deep green of jonquils, almost hidden under brambles. And I come back with clippers to slice the prickly stalks, rake out their wiry tangles, and yank down wisteria vines from the five choke cherry trees. All morning, thorns tear red streaks across my bare arms and back. But I smile, remembering the story of the joyful thief who seeks no object, who hoists himself up merely because the blank wall astounds his shout, who laughs when broken glass rends his hands and belly, and I'm with him now as he moves through death's orchard in a blurred, ecstatic rage and plucks from a tree the ripe tear that weds and waits into earth. These are the last uh, two poems I'll read. <clears throat> this is called Friday Lunch Break. It's set both in New York City and in Virginia. The summer before last, we sublet an apartment just outside the meatpacking district in New York. And, uh, the year previous to that, we had been living in a cottage in the middle of a pasture as opposed to near a pasture where we are last, this past year. We were, the cottage somehow was literally within the, the pasture, which got to be rather troublesome when you had to uh, park your car in the middle of the cow herd or when it got cold in the winter and all the, the whole herd huddled up against your uh, chimney. So we were much happier moving on to a, a farm where uh, we had a fence around the yard. In any case, both experiences uh, involved me with beef cattle in a way I had not. I don't know. I can't say any more than that. I don't really know what my attitude toward beef cattle is anymore. It's changed. More than that, I couldn't say. And so this was about that. It begins in New York, goes back to Virginia, and returns to New York again. Friday lunch break. <clears throat> At noon, still wearing their white plastic helmets and long smocks, they leave the frozen slabs of calf hanging from aluminum hooks on the loading dock and stride down the street past my window, headed for the bank on the corner. I remember the gray calf we found last spring in Virginia, hidden by its mother in a gully. At six days, it scampered and wobbled. We watched it grow heavy and slow until half a year later, 
fouled with its own shit and dull of eye. It stood with the other cattle, hock deep in muck by the barn. Then it was gone, perhaps north to this gallows place where the men tromped back, grinning, some with bottles and brown paper sacks. These men in spattered white smocks were as thick and wide as the sides of beef they hug and wrestle, angels of meat. Um, one of the smaller pleasures of poetry is that it's uh, the last phrase, angels of meat, is uh, syntactically completely ambiguous so that it, it can apply either to the men or the sides of beef. I hope that's true. If anyone ever tells me it's not true, I'll quit. I mean, that, that seems important to me as a result. Maybe this is the last poem, and then if, if anyone uh, any questions or anything. It's called Arriving on Foot. <clears throat> Arriving on Foot. Reeds bending in wind. Electrical hum from a roadside pole. Behind the red house, gray clouds and the rumble of summer thunder. Shabby coat I wear, sack of bones I lug, dump them on the lawn for the dog to gnaw, and I'll lie down, a pile of rags on the porch by the front door. Thank you. Just timed it wrong, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, re-raid the uh, announcements. Don't forget, Kofi Winner. We're reading here January 5th, Thursday at 8 o'clock. There will be an open reception in a few minutes. Senior Commons room. Please, most